Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, and welcome to Scream Something, Volume 21. My name is Emily, and I'm here with my co-host, producer Neil. Hey everyone, in Scream Something, Emily and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episode of Season 4 that were released the last two Thursdays. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. But our team will be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns we had planned for after the season finale. Hi guys! Ah! Welcome back to the Watchtower, Rich. Thanks. <laughs> Neil, lock me out. I haven't been able to get in for like two years. <laughs> Producer Neil wins. You were you were on hiatus. You were on oh, hiatus. It's right. Fine. Happens all the time. Sure. Hiatus. <laughs> Is that what you've been telling people? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me back for the finale. Of course. You are always welcome. I'm looking at you, McGann. I know you're afraid of abusing your power, but you're a ball of sunshine hiding a terrifying demigoddess. When the time comes, you can't hold back. And with that out of the way, let's head and it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles for this week's episodes are Over and Out and Death and Rebirth. The release dates were June 2nd and 9th of 2022. The in-episode dates were September 14th through 17th. The directors for this week's episodes were Christopher Berkeley and Vinton Hoik. Uh, and the writers were just Greg Weissman. He wrote both of these. <laughs> just in time for your next mission. Episode 25 picks up right where last week's left off, with everyone having a very bad time on Trombus. Lorzad explains the whole time travel and phantom zone situation of the whole season that we've been dealing with to his parents, who agree to go with him to Earth. And after the credits, uh, Feora goes back through the boom tube to gather Zod's army in the Phantom Zone. But when Lore insists on taking his parents to Earth immediately, thus closing the boom tube to the Phantom Zone, she and the other Kryptonians are trapped. The Zods travel to Earth, taking Connor, Macomb, and the Mother Thrall with them, and end up in Superman's Fortress of Solitude. Uh, Lore wants to kill Superboy immediately, but Zod insists that he successfully turned Connor's loyalty, and this definitely won't be a problem. <laughs> on Trombus, one set of our heroes recover enough to get on Bioship and head back to Earth, and in the Phantom Zone, most of the OG team defends a newly reopened boom tube to prevent any of the other Kryptonians from getting to Earth. Nightwing heads through that boom tube to figure out what's on the other side, only to discover the Zods charging up their newfound superpowers. But before he can do much more than slow them down for a second, Lorzod attacks him and seemingly kills him. I'm sure there won't be any anything about this ever again. <laughs> no. Ursa goes into a rage over all the power she believes the world owes her. And... This rant seems to catch the attention of the green eye Lore stole from Metron's vault earlier in the season. The eye turns out to be a powerful artifact known as the Eye of Ekron, and it bestows incredible power on Ursa and transforms her into the Emerald Empress. Soon after, the boom tube to the Phantom Zone begins to collapse, with the team and the House of Zod still inside. The Kryptonians flee back into the Phantom Zone, and Zatanna opens a portal back to the Magic School Bus, but Rocket doesn't make it out. Yep, but Rocket doesn't make it through and is is seemingly trapped in the boom tube as it breaks down. The Bioship team arrives at the Fortress of Solitude, but are shot out of the sky by the Emerald Empress, with seemingly everyone dying in the crash except for Superman. When Superman refuses to pledge himself to Zod's cause, Zod incapacitates him with the kryptonite from the Phantom Zone. The whole Zod crew then travels to Planet Circle in Metropolis, where they wreak some general supervillain havoc and destruction before setting Superboy up to kill Superman on live TV. The season finale picks up immediately afterward with Zod ordering Connor to kill Superman. But then we cut back in time five minutes before to see that the Fortress of Solitude, Nightwing, and the whole crew of the Bioship actually survived last episode and had all faked their own deaths to buy time against Zod. So now everyone's faked their death. Everyone's gotten in on the gag. And with some of the Bioship team, Again. Again. Some of them multiple times. Wait, is this fourth time for Tigris? I'm trying to count yeah. how many. 
<laughs> and with some of the Bioship team needing to heal and the rest needing to find a way to get to Metropolis, baby Bioship arrives right on time to transport everyone to the city with adorable baby whale noises. Back in Planet Circle, Connor remembers enough of his life to refuse to kill Superman. Before Zod can kill both of them in retaliation, Kid Flash and the Magic School Bus team arrive on the scene, soon followed by the baby Bioship crew. Now it's time for an all-out, full-scale, finale superhero extravaganza. And while the play-by-play would be too long for us to go over here, the highlight reel includes the following. Miss Martian healing Superboy's mind, a Kryptonian showdown, Danny Chase actually being alive and kicking Macomb out of his brain, Rocket showing up alive in a time sphere, and most of the Kryptonians plus Macomb getting thrown back into the Phantom Zone. When the tide of battle turns, the Eye of Ekron flies off with Ursa and Orzad steals the time sphere that Rocket had arrived in, prompting the Legionnaires to lament that with lore, who knows where in the time stream, they're right back where they started. But the next day in Metropolis, we see Clark informing Johnny that not only is Connor not dead, but he and McGann are getting married tomorrow before the next world ending event can happen. So the next day in Happy Harbor, before the ceremony, Black Canary discusses the idea of opening a mental health sanctuary for superheroes in need of a break with some of the other League members. And Queen Perdita tells Garfield that while she still cares about him, they both need to move on. Several of the other heroes discuss the fact that they can't leave any of the Kryptonians in the Phantom Zone forever, and which, yes, far surpassing their originally allotted time. Release all of them on Trombus to prevent any further cal- calamity. But a cut over to the War World reveals that Vandal Savage has already rounded up and captured all of the Kryptonians in the zone, minus the one that was given to Apocalypse in tribute along with Macomb. Macomb is rewarded for his service by being gifted a pristine planet for the White Martians to escape to. And back in Happy Harbor, Rocket explains that she survived the boom tube with Metron's help, who offered her the time sphere programmed to arrive in Metropolis at the exact right time. And we find out that as Lorzad escaped Metropolis in the same in that same time sphere, the controls were already programmed to take him back to Mars six months earlier, where he attempts to kill Superboy again, only to wind up being caught in the kryptonite explosion, dying in the blast, finally explaining the shadow on the cave wall, just as Metron had planned. And somewhere out in space, the Emerald Empress reminds us all that she's already pregnant and swears to raise lore and get vengeance for the House of Sod. Back in Happy Harbor, Brainiac 5 arrives in a time sphere because there are seemingly endless supplies of them from the future to take the Legionnaires back to their proper time. And now it's time for a wedding. And basically every supporting character you could imagine from the last four seasons is in attendance. And Connor and McGann get married and it's absolutely lovely and will break down all the reasons I cried in just a little bit. Uh, But after the credits roll over all the super pets taking a nap at the wedding, we cut to Apocalypse, where Graven introduces Granny Goodness's two newest furies, Black Mary, formerly known as Mary Bromfield, who we saw recruited earlier in the season, and Kara zor better known as Supergirl. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. I, you, you guys got some master to talk about? Nope, I came back for nothing. Crash the mode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, it's probably, probably nothing. I probably don't have a page and a half of things that have just had me screaming at my television. Definitely not. Oh, uh, let's do this. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. So where do we want to start with this? Because this is two episodes of awesomeness. And I know what most of my notes are about. Mm, I wonder. (laughs) What could that have been about? I wonder. Mm. I'm sure it was about all of the the planet names. It's, yeah, definitely. Those are definitely what I wrote all my notes about. Uh, I didn't even, you know, just completely leave those off my bullet points because I knew you guys would be able to take care of that while I screamed into eternity about how my ship got married. But uh, I'll I'll get to that in a bit. Let's talk about some other stuff first before I literally become unhinged. Um, Let's talk about planet episode twenty five. <laughs> <laughs> We can. We can either jump around or we can go from 25 into 26. No, let's what's, what's do it in some kind of order, like professionals. Yeah. Let's do it in some kind of order. Okay. Well, episode 25, 
has a lot of cool stuff and is very cool, even though it is, it feels, episode 25 really just feels like set up for the finale, but I absolutely don't mind because the payoff is so cool. <laughs> yeah. And episode 25 was still also very fun and cool. Um, most of my notes aren't about it, but the few that I do have include uh, that I really, I, this is, I think this is the first time we're seeing the inside of the Fortress of Solitude, and I like the set dressing for it. It's cool. It looks interesting. And I like that Superboy's costume is included in the lineup of stuff. It's like the Batcave. Yeah, right. All exactly. All Robin costumes. But a little less, a little less sad. That one gets kind of sad sometimes. This one's just cool. <laughs> Less. Well, I mean, up in, up in, it was it was almost as sad up until now. It was going to be as sad. OK, to be fair, as I'm saying it, I'm as I'm saying it, I'm realizing I'm like, oh, right. Yeah. No, everybody thought Connor was dead there. For <laughs> a while, so that makes um, I didn't even uh, think never about mind. it. I take back my comment that it wasn't sad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sad until just recently. I love I love that uh, the dick shows up. He's like, let's see what's on the other side of this boom tube. He shows up and he's like, oh no, I'm going to die. And so <laughs> then he like, he like, he's like, I can take out these uh, solar tubes and then I better fake a death real quick or I'm really going to be dead. Yep. But when it did happen, I, I was watching his, his head bleed out and his heart rate go down. And I was like, yeah, Greg's not going to do this to me. Is he? No. Is he? Just- <laughs> no. This has got to, he's slowing his, he's slowing I- his heart down with meditation and head wounds bleed really well maybe that's it and that was like oh i I was right thank goodness (laughs) it was it was one of those things where i sat there going they can't they can't possibly do this please please do not (laughs) like i couldn't i couldn't tamp down all the fear so i spent that whole week in some form state of anxiety but there was at least enough of me that was like it'll it'll be fine they faked a lot of it'll be fine it's the it's fine because I had to tell myself something or I was just going to collapse. Uh, so- I made myself kind of forget that happened. And then at the beginning of the next episode, <laughs> when he comes walking out, well, I was yeah. like, yeah, everything's fine. Oh, wait, wasn't he? Oh, right. Everything's fine. Good. All right, cool. <laughs> I retrieved oh, yeah. that memory I didn't like. <laughs> and I can fix it now. Many, many cliffs were hung at the end of 25. <laughs> right. And it was just like, oh, wait. Okay, so Rocket, you died. Um, Dick, you kind of died. Uh, McGann, you look dead too. Rikers, you're dead. I'm running out of fingers on this hand. What? Yeah. Huh? Superman's looking pretty green. <laughs> it was. It was so many people that my brain was like, they can't possibly all die, right? No. But again, I can never say that with Young Justice because who knows if I'll ever be. Yeah, right. absolutely. <laughs> There's always the fear. The odds are low, but never zero. The whole thing with Dick made sense, though. Because, I mean, he shows up and he's like, I got three Kryptonians. And one of them's pretty full power. The other two aren't quite full power yet, but it doesn't matter. Like, I- I'm going to have to stop that from getting any further. And then I don't know what I'm going to do. So it was kind of cool that it-, it did all make sense in retrospect, um, which I liked. I d- didn't like. I liked not liking it. I didn't like liking it. I don't know. It's something like that. And we have more evidence of uh, Nightwing being a showbiz kid as he understands <laughs> the <laughs> tricks from pro wrestling. Yeah, he's like, it's a pro wrestling trick. Me, this this season has included me just picking out every line and moment that makes me go, oh, right, Zatanna and Nightwing are both very much showbiz children. <laughs> very showbiz children. Uh, and, and nerdy. So happy. <laughs> and- <laughs> yes. Nightwing just being like, Lord of the Rings. I'm like. Ah, uh, you were a mathlete. We love you. So um, happy. <laughs> well, then you had a 300 reference, which is like. Oh, and a 300 reference, yeah. And confirms at least one more book in Young Justice. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> That's fair. Or at least just a movie series. Maybe just went straight to movie. Who knows? I'm just <laughs> kidding. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but it does make, it does, it does just keep, keep establishing this Dick Grayson. It's like, my favorite, my favorite Dick Grayson that's, that's ever been. <laughs> and that's saying something. It's saying something. It absolutely is. Speaking speaking of books, though, in Young Justice, I do want to call it some of the Easter eggs in Planet Circle 
that uh, we noticed and have been laughing about for two weeks it, with all of the billboards and electronic ads. A lot of them are for stuff that we, you know, have seen many times. Chicken Whizzies, uh, Space Trek 3016, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there's also the mysteries of Adolfo the movie, yeah. <laughs> which <laughs> just losing my mind in the background. Um, and also laughing forever at the great con the musical mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm like excuse me <laughs> i don't i don't put it past anybody to make that but also can i have more information immediately <laughs> <laughs> i uh, well part of me part of me wants to really know if in world there is a new york and in world, then is there a Times Square? Because like that's really really funny that there would potentially be one of these started first. There was a Times Square, and Metropolis was like, "Yeah, we got this. We're gonna call this the Planet Circle." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think this I is also a good a good it. opportunity. I don't even know if you can still find it, but that uh, <laughs> uh, assistant backup editor. Uh, Richard Kreutz Landry went through and read the mysteries of Adolfo for us oh, and then right. live, live, live yes. tweeted it. So, we, so none of us would have to read it. <laughs> it's, I think I'm pretty sure it's still out there somewhere. It's still out there on Twitter. It's a very long thread of uh, wonderful assistant editor Richard <laughs> attempting to be like, what's the connection what though? Going and on I here? think it boiled down to, we still have no we still idea. Don't know. <laughs> Oh, it's just a thing. We'll never know. We. I just <laughs> assume Greg we... liked it. Just he just, <laughs> he just liked like, the book. Yeah, I like this book. That's all it was. There's literally no other connection. That's the joke. Yeah, no spoilers. <laughs> hashtag. But yes, uh, ve it's very for those who haven't heard us talk about this before. It's a very old gothic novel. It's not even the most famous gothic novel out there. Uh, but it's everywhere in Young Justice, uh, and we joke about it all the time. Yes, because the first season isn't it's the mysteries of Udolfo that that Dick pulls on to open up the secret passage. Yep, and then yep. Connor's reading Throughout it on his birthday. Most of this... <laughs> like... Granny goodness is yep. reading it. It's <laughs> Granny goodness is reading it. It's, it's right. also even in Artemis's arc this season that had many references to many other books. If you look on her nightstand, it's one of the books <laughs> on her nightstand when she's a teenager. Uh, it's everywhere. So funny. <laughs> All right, Great Con the musical. Great con the musical, I have many questions. Uh, as I said, don't put it past anybody for a second to make it, but I want to know more. I want to see I want to see a credit scene, a, a, a an end credit scene with um, Savage just sitting in the audience. <laughs> so you just you mean just that uh, post credit scene from Hawkeye that's Rogers the musical, <laughs> right. but with this exactly yeah. where he's sitting, he's like oh, he's like that guy wasn't so that inaccurate. guy wasn't even there. <laughs> <laughs> that's not how it happened at all. <laughs> oh, it would be even funnier it. if he Absolutely. wrote it. Absolutely, <laughs> it's all part of the grand plan. It's so it's like I gotta have, I, I got big uh, plans. I gotta rest sometime on the weekends. I just wrote this musical. It's just a passion project. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you guys have uh more notes for twenty five? Because that's most of my stuff. Uh, because most of my notes are twenty six. But please. Run, be free. I had definitely missed that it was referred to as the mother thrall until until like watching it again. I was like, oh, I guess yeah. that makes sense. But it also made me think of like, are they permanently attached to each other now? Mm, no. Okay. Because the mother box isn't attached to uh, Danny Chase's box at the wedding. Oh, okay. So he's, he's just the box. Okay at that point again so it doesn't seem to be any sort of permanent thing as just how they refer to stuff i guess okay it with their makes powers me question combined. Well, what was with their powers combined uh poor danny that's all i gotta say danny was like a fairly oof. minor character in the titans but man that whole arc not to do too much callback because i know you probably talked about it already and we'll talk about it in future episodes but oof buddy talk about therapy oh my gosh poor kid just want to give him a, yeah. a cubicle hug, a cube shaped hug. I don't know. Um, the uh, Emerald Eye of Ekron. Let me just move into that uh, for a happier note. Yeah. Um, so the em I saw him pull that thing out of Metron's box and I was like, oh, no. 
what are they gonna <laughs> don't what are they doing with that ha, the emerald eye of ekron it, it, the emerald empress is this villain from the fatal five who's a, a villain group from the legionnaires in the future in the 31st century so this eye is in here its origins are wacky and like with lots of things it's had a few different things um, mostly it's considered a mystical device that's most of its origins there was a short period of time where it was literally the eye of a green lantern who whose psyche just cracked after his entire sector that he was supposed to be um protecting got destroyed it, it so the powers are like a green lantern so the powers are kind of like a green lantern anyway but i did notice in here because i was wondering like what it, which which of the many origins are they going to go with and Zatanna literally says, this thing is out, is out magicking me. Like I am, I, I it's, it's out of my league. So um, it, it is a mystical device. And a funny thing about the Legion in the future is there's actually a lot of magic. So you think it's like 31st century high tech science fiction-y kind of stuff, but there's an entire planet full of sorcerers. One of their main villains is, um, is a Lord of Chaos that name Mordu. he's this wizard in the future so there's all this magic as well as everything else so but i have to say giving the eye of ekron to a kryptonian that's terrible that's a terrible choice for the universe it's basically superman with a green lantern ring and let's just see how well that goes uh and and in one of the episodes the next episode she, she's like attacking Zatanna with the eye uh, the eye is attacking Zatanna, and she's using heat vision at the same time and so I'm just like, oh, this is awful. So I'm I'm interested to see if that Emerald Empress comes back or if they're just kind of, no pun intended, planting the seeds of the Daxum planet thing, which we can talk about later for the future. I, yikes. Anyway, uh, the other things that I loved, I already mentioned it earlier, but the little space whale noises when baby Bioship shows up makes me, makes me really happy. <laughs> makes me really happy. <laughs> It's just one more detail of the thing that I said way back at the er early in Scream Somethings for this season of like, this show genuinely made me like cry over a non-speaking, not like personified in any normal way spaceship that can't talk or anything. And I'm just like, I care about she's a character. And it's because they just do really emotive special uh, sound effects for both of them. I'm like, yeah, no, you have a personality and I care about you. <laughs> Absolutely. And I will cry about it. <laughs> I was I was thinking about it and like up until this point, like the most personified action I feel like Bioship has ever taken is spitting out the treadmill. Because for the most part, it's just just, you know, morphing from one thing to the other and being Bioship. Um, but that's definitely the most. Hey, I got to turn into an egg. But uh, I don't need this thing in here anymore. Yeah. But yeah, just thinking about it, like, you know, after four seasons, it's one of the more, if not most personified thing yet you know, all three of us still certainly have that emotional attachment. Um, yeah. Without any words. No words. Bioships, good. <clears throat> I don't, 10 out of 10 Bioship. <laughs> 10 out of 10 with Bioship again. I don't think I have, I don't think I have anything else specific to that particular episode. So unless, Neil, you have 10 million notes to say about 25. I think we can get into uh, the 10 million things that happened in 26. Yeah. <laughs> Just so much. <laughs> How much. Also, people may notice like 25 is 22 minutes long. The final episode of the season is 27 minutes long. Like they were like, we're packing as much in as we can. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it works and it's amazing. So little things before I get into the what most of my notes are <laughs> my little things that i liked in this were uh the nod of nightwing admitting that they have faked so many deaths on this team and that it is just the crux oh, yeah. of the finale is everybody faked their deaths again <laughs> is perfection we appreciate a nice little just lampshading that moment of just pointing out we're like we're, we'll admit it we've done yeah. it a lot uh also the magic school bus entrance into the fight is everything. It is perfect. And it made me so happy. So many things in this finale fight made me so happy. But that entrance where it's just 
school bus. <laughs> Magic flying school bus directly into a Kryptonian. <laughs> uh, like cheer laughing. The only way that I can explain it. I'm like, this is incredible. Also, I felt fa- okay. Random things that are I'm interested in that don't have any real bearing on anything. So that's yeah, totally fair. Yeah. So Calder says the Tragawag magic is holding. Does that in turn imply that now it is like a more powerful bus than it was previously? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Probably. Oh yeah. For sure. I mean, because you definitely just ran into a Kryptonian. And if I've watched enough Smallville, which I have, because I guessed on another podcast, uh, anytime a bus hits Clark, it is destroyed instantly everywhere. I love the of the anytime, like at least once a season, a bus is hitting Clark. So, I, you know, we've got a lot of data, a lot of data points. We do, Well, we do, because one of the things tracked in Farm to Fable, a podcast you guys, anyone listening to this should definitely listen to it if you like Smallville. One of the things that, that are tracked are vehicles destroyed. Like a constant running tally uh, of vehicles destroyed. Very nice. Yes. So, so it is truly a full magic school bus. I, I love it. I picture some villain like the calculator or something. He's like, he's like, I think I know where where somebody's secret identity is based on the destruction of vehicles around town. How, how many? There's so many insurance claims yep. filed in Smallville. How many F-150s are being shipped to Smallville every year? We this is ridiculous. Yes. <laughs> Per, the per capita on these things <laughs> doesn't make any sense. <laughs> or insurance claims, one or the other. Something about that. Yep. <laughs> I I loved the there's a there's a moment where um Superboy in his solar suit slams into Aqualad. And I was like, okay, that was fun. The little callback to season one, like, yeah. you know, like first premiere. I love it. They keep getting those little showdowns between the two of them. And you're just like, oh, it's a callback. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the other little things? Oh, Saturn girl. Knowing that Dan, Danny needs to kick this guy out of his own head. Right. Like he, he's got to, he's got to take control of his own, um, own business there. And I, I really, really like that. Uh, Brainiac five. I loved all the designs on the Legion so far. The, the one thing in the the original Legion comic is, you know, in the original one from the sixties and seventies, Everybody's a humanoid. Just about pretty much everybody's a humanoid. Oh, and yeah. they all just look like, like Brainiac 5 just looks like a green human with yellow hair. Like, and in this one, I couldn't quite tell. It looked like a really cool mashup of some of the other Brainiac 5s I've seen in like Justice League Unlimited with also the Brainiac 5 that's actually a full like living machine that was from the Legion of Superheroes animated series that uh, Brandon Vietti did a lot of directing on. And so I couldn't quite, I liked that I couldn't quite tell because there's always like a toss up, like is Brainiac Five organic or is he not organic? How did this happen, right? But his eyes look a little mechanical. He doesn't have a nose. His voice sounded really modulated, and so I was like, "Hmm, they're doing something interesting here, and I want to see what it is." Combining that with a complete a throwback to one of my uh, OTPs, I did use that right. It's been a while. It's a little rusty. Yes. Supergirl yes. and Brainiac Five, and so Supergirl showed up in this episode, and Brainy showed up in this episode. And you get a glimpse of that in the Justice League, anim- uh, Justice League Unlimited uh, episode where Supergirl goes to the future and ends up staying there. So that was really cool. So I'm interested to see if that ends up turning out being a thing. That's a major plot point right there. So I love the design. I've loved the design in all of them. I think Chameleon Boy looks great. Phantom Girl looks great. Um, Saturn Girl, I think Saturn Girl is, there was a human colony on Titan, which is a moon of Saturn. So I think she's supposed to look just human. Um, which works out Uh, as someone who didn't read those comics when they were first coming out maybe because i wasn't alive um but (laughs) it it, 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 it hampered my ability it really hampered my ability to do so that was one thing i noted when i started no excuse neil i'm sorry but like on dc infinite no um but i started reading a bunch of them and it was one of the things i noticed i was like oh man everybody's kind of a four-limbed individual that's really interesting thankfully everyone yeah. also says their name all the time or else i'd be very confused as to who i'm looking at roll calls and and saying things like i'm like emily booza this is what i am trying to tell you right now it's kind of like how they did rich it. howard <laughs> that's a great point <laughs> exactly indeed neil powell thank you very much for saying so yes 
Roll calls were big. Roll calls were definitely big. When you've got the Legion was lit was gigantic. There were so many members. So they were like, hey, we're using these 12 members. We're going to introduce them to you in the beginning with all of the list of their powers and little sub box and like a whole deal. Because you had to keep track of everything. Let's see. What else? Other random little things that I love in that fight. We get Superman and Superboy getting that nice callback to see the season two premiere with that combo that they do yeah. where <laughs> Superman just throws him. Uh, it's very fun to see that again. We haven't got to see it in a bit. Uh, we also get the callback to the West Maneuver, yes. which was first introduced in season three, but is just tripping an enemy like you're on the playground. Uh, <laughs> I love it. It's very good. It's the thing Kid Flash does in the premiere, the original premiere of the whole series. That's what I was thinking. Like, there's at least two. I wonder if there's more. I didn't even think about that. There's at least two callbacks to that very, very first, the very first like major, the premiere episodes. This finale has a lot of callbacks to a lot of stuff, and they all make me very happy. Yeah. Well, yeah, then Kid Flash saving Tigress. Yeah. You got uh, the McGann healing Connor's mind is exactly the same pose as bereft and everything. That's good. Which uh gonna just going to do very quick shout out to rewatching that episode and listening to the music in that scene. The music in that scene is phenomenal and nearly made me cry all on its own it's very very good and i just there's so much happening in this show sometimes small details fall through the cracks and i need to call that one out because it's very good also i will admit i am an absolute sucker for two characters saying hi to each other like it's the most intimate thing in the world (laughs) Uh, it's a very good trope and it just completely shatters my heart every single time it definitely needed Um, to be there and worked so well i saw it coming and i was like please do yes there it is. Like, uh, again, sometimes I'm a parody of myself, guys. <laughs> like this, this episode had so much that my heart full of joy. And speaking of my heart full of joy, uh, I just I don't I have no very good transition into this. But so I, in this episode, Nightwing says tells him again, "You're a ball of sunshine hiding a terrifying demigoddess." And I screamed and then started crying and had to pause the show and collect myself. I laughed so hard when i heard that yeah i was like go back 10 seconds you say that again right now yeah so for clarity for anyone who has not listened to all 200 something episodes of this podcast shame on you uh i have for a very long time called miss martian a ball of sunshine and a terrifying demigod uh it i think the earliest version of it pops up in our masks ap that we did where gm uh brennan conway called McGann a telekinetic demigod at some point. And I think later in that same game, I called her a ball of sunshine or shortly after. Uh, And those two things together became a thing I have called McGann for a very long time. Uh, And some people know, we've talked about it before, Greg Weissman listens to the podcast every now and then, uh, will message us to like say nice things or to call us out jokingly when we get things wrong. Call us out. It's, it's we, mainly, the second, we, mainly the second one, but okay. Eh, when we when we have it's like three days water. when we have three days to write an outline and I miss a uh, fact somehow. Uh sometimes we get called out and we're like, sorry, we'll we'll fix it later. We'll fix it. But about a year and a half ago, sometime in twenty twenty, he messaged us out of nowhere and asked, Hey, what's that thing Emily calls Miss Martian some about a goddess or something like that and I responded and was like oh the thing that I'd say she's a ball of sunshine and a terrifying demigod and he goes yeah that thanks and said nothing else uh, and, he, and a year and a half and I just put that in a box in the back of my brain and went don't think about it don't think about it don't get any hopes up it probably was nothing don't worry about it he's probably explaining something about the podcast to somebody Think nothing of it. Put it in a box in the back of your brain. Uh, And then as the season went on, I thought to myself, I'm like, when this is all over, I should email Greg Weissman or something and just ask him what that was about. If it's not clear by the end of the season. And then this episode (laughs) happened. And suddenly it was clear why this question had been asked. So, yeah, that was a weird little shout out to us. that That is still consistently breaking my brain. And it's just real cool. It was really, really sweet. <laughs> it was really cool. It was really sweet. And the fact that it was delivered by Dick, I like to pretend that that's a nod well, to me. That, hey, I, that's what I said. <laughs> probably so. making that up. <laughs> Who knows? It's, you, it's free. I love that for you, Rich. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to live in that. <laughs> it's my head cannon. <laughs> Could never have imagined this happening. Not sure I've fully processed it. Still just, yeah. 
I screamed and then I teared up and then I had to pause to collect myself before watching the rest of the episode. And that is completely true. And uh... <laughs> it's it's such a it's such a perfect line for what was happening right there. Too. Oh, yeah. Like it was the it was the perfect line. And it called back so nicely to look, I know we've had these things in the past. Right. I know we've challenged you on this. I know you have concerns about this, but now's the time. Right. You got this. You got this now. You've grown and we're all good. And it was such a good dick, like encouraging speech. And it was just fit so perfectly into it. Gosh, it was it was so it was so good. And on a less shrieking fangirl side note, in a less this is breaking my brain thing and more of I am an English major thing. I think it's very cool that in an episode in which everyone is constantly reminding us how once the sun rises, uh, it will fully heal and power up all of the Kryptonians. McGann gets called a ball of sunshine, not 10 minutes before healing a Kryptonian. It's a nice, it's a nice little, little, nice little metaphor. Nice little good, good. Makes my English major heart happy. Makes my shipper heart happy. It makes the podcaster part of my brain scream incessantly and it hasn't stopped. For two weeks. <laughs> uh, but it's fine. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> to build off of that line and uh, what you were saying about Dick's just general encouraging speech, I am absolutely overjoyed in that final battle to see McGann not holding back while also having gained like the hard won maturity and control over her powers that not holding back just means she is able to completely guide a situation and capacitate every bad guy she fights without killing or mentally destroying anyone. It's very nice. It's all yeah. of the aesthetics and awesomeness of like Galadriel darkness, cosmic power McGann without any of like <laughs> the, you know, Bad stuff of that. Any of the complicated, <laughs> guilt-ridden, moral quandaries of what is and isn't okay. It's just began being incredible and just <laughs> devastating everyone. Was very happy with that. I was like, okay, I get what Dick's saying, but please, please, I don't want us to go back down this path of like McGann murdering. No. Can we not? Can we not do this? I just don't need that today. Uh, and instead, it's like, yeah, not holding back, and not holding back means that you are in control of what you're doing. I'm like, yes. So cheers. Uh, cheers stop to all. Trying to kill my boyfriend. <laughs> yes. Or my man, yeah. wasn't it? it was stop trying man. to kill my man. I was like, uh. But yeah, no, that was very good. I'm like, yes. <laughs> McCann, just <laughs> stop it. Because like, I just I just <laughs> want to leave right now. Can we end this? <laughs> McGann would like to be anywhere else, and it's incredible. So one of the things that I was like personally kind of wrapped up in, and this happened it makes a callback back to something that happened earlier in the season was when Clark and Lois are talking to, to, to John, Jonathan about uh, Connor being alive again, but like how they handled it was so beautiful. And I, so the scene where it happened before, where they talked to talk to him about Connor's death before uh, as a, as a hospice nurse, I was like, and, and a father, I was like, this is amazing. This entire thing is handled so well. And I'm tearing up and I talked to Greg and I told Greg how much it meant to me as a, as a nurse and a, and a dad that was handled so well, because talking to kids about that is a really challenging thing. And pe- some people are like, oh, I'm not going to do it. You know, I'm not going to fall through with it. or I'm not going to take them to the funeral or it's going to be an open casket. We don't want them to see that way. And, and th- these are conversations that we have with, with families. And um, he said it was, it was his daughter who had given him all of that information, Aaron, who had talked to him about that, which was amazing. And then this follow up too, like checking in with him about like, look, like you may have processed the fact that he's gone now, but like, do you want to talk to him? Like, will it be, it, would that be okay? Like, it, it's not, is it going to be scary to you? Like that is something to check in. It's talking to the kids. It's not talking at them. It's not making decisions for them, right? It's letting them be part of the process. That's healthy, emotional growth, right? letting them make some, some choices, particularly about stuff like that. And then listening to them when they, when they answer you. So that scene, as small as that scene was, as quick as that scene was, it just needs to be pointed out. So well done. And, and on a, that same healthy note, the, another note I put in here was Garfield and Perdita, you know, like that was a hard conversation. I'm sure for Perdita to have and definitely a hard conversation for Gar to have, 
But like, that was the appropriate situation. That was the appropriate response for her. Like, it's been too much. It's been a lot. It's time for me to move on. And I've already moved on because I didn't have any other choice at the time, but now I have. And you need to too. And it was very loving and respectful and Gar seemed to handle it okay. And, you know, so those kinds of things, that emotional conversation thing has always been something from the very first season of Young Justice that has always blown my mind. When everybody just talks about their problems right before the end of the finale and then you know, I'm like, wait, that's supposed to go on for five more seasons of unnecessary drama. What do you mean you're talking to your friends? What do you mean you're like they support with you? people? <laughs> right. What do, you- maybe, maybe, what do you mean you're trusting people? Will they? Won't they? <laughs> Will they? Won't? Oh, oh, actually, they do. They do. It's great. Okay, perfect. Um, but Young Justice handles those things so well and c- keeps handling it so well. Neil, what you got? What was the... I'm trying to think because there's so much. And I think that's probably one of the biggest issues here. I, the one that I keep standing out, so I'll mention it, is that um, Forager is what set to be the greatest Green Lantern of all time. She's so good. She's yeah, got such yeah, strong willpower. Real good. Yeah, that, yeah, the, <clears throat> the real thing good. that laid Metron low. Yeah, that's cool. But I'm going to go ahead and get out of that for a second. And just, just be she fine. Just, she just believes in herself so much. I love right. her. I've had Forager for five minutes. So and good. I would do anything for her. I know. Oh. It's so good. Other little things from this. I love the moment of Superboy offering mercy to Zod and being like, hey, you did one good thing for me. If you give up now, we'll all, we'll all figure this out. And Zod's like, no. He's like, okay, fine. Then I guess we're punching each other in the face. And I'm just like, away game- we go. Superboy, <laughs> full of the ability to forgive. He is so good. We love him. Also, <laughs> there. I've had no other way that I could ex- that I could explain this other than with a reference to something else. But with the miraculous returns of Danny Chase, Rocket, and so many other people in this episode, this episode has strong and Tiny Tim, who did not die. Oh, is <laughs> it that die. swell <laughs> energy? And honestly, I love it. I love that energy. This is a Muppets Christmas Carol reference for anyone who somehow does not know, but it's amazing. <laughs> it's the <laughs> long pause, who did not die? <laughs> and I'm like, that's everyone in this finale. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And with Rocket, too, like, okay, so Rocket shows up. She's stepping out of a, she's stepping out of the, the, the bubble. And I'm like, okay that needs an explanation right and later on and so she's like oh my my field protected me somehow and then the next thing i know i'm in metron's like place and i'm like okay so my brain started running around with this and probably went into too many places (laughs) but the one thing that we know about the uh collective technology the collect the the collector the collectors are the ones the collectors collective excuse me the collective which were the aliens that icon kind of is associated with and the collective technology or the is the belt that rocket's wearing oh yeah so there was this thing about like Sorry. like wait, what's oh! that? No, just like <laughs> me like me catching myself and being like oh that was that was dramatic like that was genuinely me making connect- i'm sorry it sounded like it's i was okay, no that no. astonishment but i wasn't no not at all well i do so like i was thinking back on like season two and i was like okay blue beetles technology was talking about how the the uh uh new genesis technology was incompatible incompatible and so like there's this idea of like there's all these different aliens and have all these different technologies and they all do different things and like uh i don't know there was my brain was starting to run off of that and so i think what happened was that it just kind of protected her for a minute until Metron could pull her out because Metron created the boom tubes, right? And then and pull her out. But it does make me wonder, like, can we get into a place where Rocket has more powers? Like, what happens if this, what happens if this, this device, right, this uh, field generating device that she has, um, like, protects her in different dimensions? Does it reach into other places? You know, like, I'm, I'm just fascinated. I kind of want to know more about, more about that. And then, and then rolling that, Rolling that into to Metron saying it's part of an experiment, and Orion going like, "Oh, that sounds right. Never mind." <laughs> like Metron's, why is Metron being yeah. so helpful? Oh, and he's not. He's just being selfish. And it's just right. all of those puzzle pieces <laughs> finally fitting together. And 
It's so good. <laughs> what was that? Somebody somebody said in our Discord, it was like, okay, Superboy pulls Metron out of a chair and makes him uncomfortable, but he puts him back in the chair. And then, it, was it oh, you, possibly. Neil? Yeah. The thing about how you're thinking is uh, Metron's just mad people touch his stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> right? He's like, don't touch my stuff. <laughs> Come save the universe. But really, people are touching my things. And I really don't like that. It wasn't an experiment. He was just bitter. <laughs> Let me touch his stuff. <laughs> and or he was like, there is one missing piece in this puzzle and I know how to solve it. Well, I also think of like the, the timeline stuff of like, how did you set the time sphere to go there at that exact time? Also, the idea that you would put more Zod back. But are you doing that to fix the time stream? Because in that current time you had up until Metron basically air quote fixes it, you had two lore Zods, but now you don't. Because now Ursa is off on Daxum while pregnant. and But also we had always had that one detail about Connor's quote unquote death that had never gotten an explanation and yes. everything. That was the, yeah. So it's the like, chatter. that was yeah. one of those things that everybody knew about and had not been ex- to the point where I'd kind of forgotten about it until it came up. And when it did, I feel like I literally went, oh, at the TV as the scene unfolded as I'm like, Oh right! I forgot. I forgot. It was beautiful. It was, it was. It was beautiful. I love that. And then, All of course, the we get that pieces. little moment of that. <laughs> that little moment of Metron just going, "Yes, my bitterness has worked. <laughs> my, my my absolutely unnecessary he vengeance. Touched, Don't touch he my touched stuff. He touched several of my things and stole one. He touched and stole my eye of Ekron. He stole two. Phantom yeah, exactly, Phantom Zone projector. He's like, I am well, done he, with you, child. Yeah, he broke the, and he broke the projector, and he, uh, <laughs> and I will say this, as an only child, he's clearly just a very angry only child. Um, <laughs> because I know, personally, if a kid got invited over and broke my stuff, I didn't invite them back, so. Um, Interesting. <laughs> Would you like to have a session with Canary? Apparently, Are you okay? Apparently. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> if I get to live for t- thousands of years, I could, I too could become that run. <laughs> don't, oh, don't touch my stuff. Cool. Um, <laughs> Great. Amazing. Uh, I think my <laughs> my last couple of things before I get into the thing that is a large bulk of my notes uh, is I think the. The energy of McGann's final moment with McCalm boiling down to, I want you to know that I could pull you back from this right now and I am choosing not to is so intense and amazing. It's a very good moment. Yeah. Uh, cause it's just, it's just good. It's just the pausing everything in his mind to say, you were happy Connor was dead and then just letting him fall into the phantom zone. <laughs> It's like everyone it all slows resolves. down into like bullet time it's, too. Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> it is the moment of not just her knowing that she could like telekinesis him out of the way. It's her being like, I want you to know. <laughs> I am choosing to let you go to Phantom Zone Prism at least for a little while. <laughs> Cause dude, yeah. what the heck? So good. Totally. Yeah. And as of course we get to everyone going like three days later, like, we can't. We can't leave anybody in the phantom zone and being like, yes, true. And we will come <laughs> up with a solution, which is also very necessary and very good. Because as ever, despite all of the Kryptonians in the phantom zone being in a weird, bad place with some weird, bad choices, the acknowledgement of all of them going, we were supposed to be here for like five, 10 years and it has been 50. I'm like, yeah, no, you are correct. That is not a justice system. Yeah, it's not. Absolutely. Uh Clarion teleports the entire war world. <laughs> Clarion does you, whatever he wants. Do other dimensions? Uh, I'm just like, but only when he wants to. Wait. Rich. <laughs> okay. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely fair that the game master is controlling this villain <laughs> and can say it's. I can say I can. Well, he does it when it's funny, and that's all the only time he does it. Right? Like a wizard did it. So, but seriously, like that that war. Okay. I'm just like, okay, that's just gives, I mean, again, Clarion's not like just following all of Savage's orders. I totally get that. Also, that takes Savage to like a whole nother level. Um, also, just let's do a quick pan of all of the nonsense uh, overpowered supervillains uh, he's been collecting in the War World <laughs> I'm storage sure, units. I'm sure that nothing will ever I'm come sure of any of this. It'll be a fine. A Kryptonian army. 
Kryptonian army. Just chilling. <laughs> Just chilling next to a bunch of other mm-hmm. villains. It's fine. Yeah, absolutely. It is interesting that I'm I'm curious as to why I love the idea. I love the idea that he that Darkseid gets Kara out because it makes callbacks to some story arcs from from the comics. But why why just her and why her specifically? Like, I'm interested as to, to know as to why he would do that. Like, he, it's like he knows something ahead of time. And Kara's like had a bunch of origins too. Usually like she's she's like was sent to Earth to take care of, of Superman, right? He's, she's sent to Earth to take care of Cal. But if something happens and wonky, timey-wimey stuff, like she just lands after him by 30 years or something. So sometimes though, like it has been used, if I, if I remember correctly, as a storyline where she ends up being put into the Phantom Zone, which makes sense. And, and even in, gosh, I can't remember what I was watching now. I think it was one of the animated movies. They were talking about like, why don't we just stick everybody in the Phantom Zone? Like, and bring them back out. It might have even been Superman the Animated Series. Like, we have a place to put everybody, right? And then we take a rocket to someplace else, and then that person frees everybody on a new planet. Sounds like a great escape plan to me, but they didn't choose to do that. But that doesn't mean that it says, like, we had the technology to be able to do this, and somebody chose to do it, including my my brother, right? So, you know, I I think that's what they did, is they put her, her in the Phantom Zone to protect her, and then she just got stuck there. And then, oh my gosh, Mary, that whole arc, that's rough. That's definitely rough. The old Sergeant Marvel story arc, because that was, that was a thing where she goes evil in kind of some really weird, questionable ways in the comics. And uh, they kind of retconned all that out of existence. But this one makes sense, you know? Like we were even talking about it with um, Chris Newton when we did the, the Shazam episode um, discussion session. I was, you know, we talked about um, well, what if somebody, why, why wouldn't you just stay Captain Marvel? Why would, why would you even go back to being a kid? And so we had these discussions and that's what Mary did. Apparently is she just kept being Sergeant Marvel and didn't come out. Yeah. And then it was becoming, it was becoming a problem, like a power addiction situation. And now, man, you do not want to be facing down <laughs> Sergeant Marvel and Supergirl. So I want to see that. I want to see that more than I think, I think almost anything else. If, there's, if quote unquote, hopefully when there's a, another season, I want to see what happens with all of that. All fingers crossed. They look so cool. That reveal at the very end. I was, I was so hyped. It's so well done. It's very cool. Also side note, small side note on that, but I love the designs for both of their fury costumes oh, yeah. because there have been, some interesting choices for various uh Kara and other fury costumes yeah. over mm-hmm. the years. And these ones I'm just like, yeah. that's just cool. That just looks cool. Both and of those makes, are great. That's great. Love that. Uh <laughs> Let me see what else I got. Oh, uh I love the double X and Craig. Oh, yeah. Are there at the oh, wedding. Are we getting to the wedding? And, yeah, Do I get five minutes wait, wait, to just wait, scream? Tra- transitioning to the wedding. I also have planets to talk about, which are the most important things. But uh Bruce Lee has a designation for the Zeta. Of too. course he does. Did you catch that? Rich. <laughs> every, All the everyone, All Literally, the my, notes, my notes just say everyone is at this wedding. Uh, and I couldn't be happier about it. I am so happy about this wedding. I do want to say before that, uh, th- McGann's line, uh, but we're determined to get married right away, you know, before anything else could go wrong is a mood. And I was so happy about it. It was very funny. Uh, I need to shout that one out because it makes me laugh every time I hear it. But everyone is at this wedding. It's like that thing in a tabletop RPG where every NPC you've ever encountered shows up at the very end to help yeah. with the big battle. That, but it's a wedding. Uh- <laughs> yeah. I, I love the Marvin and Wendy thing, too. That was so funny. Highlights of people in this crowd for me as I made notes and paused. We got Adam Strange and Alana are apparently still going yep. strong. Good for them. I we love haven't it. seen you since season two. Very cute. Danny Chase is just floating in the back with various other mechanical guests. And you know what? Good for him. I'm so happy. He's great. He can talk now. We got all the good dogs. They're all hanging out. They're all buddies. That shot of them napping, very cute. Uh, and 13's lizard. Yes, and 13's lizard. He's very cute, too. They're all there. Violet and Harper 
seem like they're at least being dates to a wedding. Very cute for them. Very happy. This note that I have is uh, Tim Drake has apparently been living right. through a roller coaster of a romantic subplot entirely off screen. <laughs> First with Wonderbird in seasons two and three. And now we got him and Spoiler just cuddling up in the background at this wedding. And it's just the most chaotic situation I can imagine that we have never gotten to see anything of. <laughs> and I think that's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> I would love to just get like a whole season or a mini, like a mini series or a spinoff with just Cam Bowen getting that just to be the whole, the whole season voicing Tim, Tim's romantic nonsense. Because in a show with 10 million romantic subplots, I think it's very funny that Tim has clearly had like a convoluted roller coaster off screen. I learned many, I learned many things from Nightwing and it's to be respectful when dating a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Though Everyone apparently agreed. he's run into more problems than Nightwing did. True. Uh, if season three had anything to say about it. And of course, the most important note for who's at this wedding is Icicle Jr. Uh, the one-two punch of Marvin saying, yeah. so I'm the only one who didn't know everybody's a superhero. And the only reason I didn't know was because everybody thought I already knew, followed by Icicle Jr. coming in. I completely lost it. I laughed so hard I had to pause because I was going to miss everything <laughs> because perfection. I wanted Ice School so, Jr. at this wedding and he is here and I could not be happier. I, we've I talked about say, that. It, it goes back as, almost as far as the quote. It's just like, if he's not at the wedding, oh, what's the point of the wedding then? No, this is just something we said one time and it was just, I think it's funny that I was like, Everything I could have had on my list was checked <laughs> off, and I'm so happy. Go. Uh, the implication there, though, is that Icicle Jr. knows everybody's secret identity? Well, what? not everybody's secret identity. Not everybody was in, in civvies. Some people were in costumes. Some people weren't. As they said, black tie optional, masks and capes optional. Batman is there as Batman, and that's very funny. That is pretty funny. But I think, doesn't Connor say something like, hey, it doesn't, it's all good. Everybody's in the know. Well, everybody and knows like, that we're superheroes. Kind of. It was how I uh, took it. I didn't think it was, okay. you have to reveal your okay. secret identity no, to everyone sense. at this party. I think it was more of a like, everyone here understands that we are a superhero community yeah. thing. That, that, that makes sense. You're right. You're right. I got you. I got you. You're right. And, and the best one is, okay. Who gave Waller <laughs> what to make this happen? Also, right. not even that. Like, what was the discussion? Are you just being honest? Like, Icicle Jr. needs to be at this wedding, okay? Listen. I, I, he was I don't hyped even know. for their engagement last uh, yeah. season. It's a very good scene. He was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Greg, uh, I remember seeing something on Twitter when people asked about High School Junior being at the wedding. Uh, Greg said, High School Junior considers himself solely responsible for them getting together. Yes. So, of course, he's at the wedding. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, which is hilarious. So funny. Can I can I have a moment to rant about every other detail at this wedding that I really love in a rapid fire manner? Oh, yes. Uh, I promise I won't take uh, you too long. Sure. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> It's not like I it's not like I completely lost it at this entire scene or anything. It's totally fine. It's not like I've been shipping this since I was 13 or anything. It's totally it's fine. <laughs> so other wedding details that I love in a rapid fire manner. This is all one bullet point in my notes. Uh, love that all of the bridesmaids have unique dresses or in Rocket's case, cool like jumpsuit that reflect their style. But in the color scheme, it's a very nice thing. I love it. Also love that both McGann and Connor both get walked down the aisle by their respective parents because it's important and I like it. I won't go into all of the all of the nonsense around that, but it's good. Uh, I love that they have the cool little flower arch thing set up that in my brain reflects the crystal canopy thing that's part of Martian weddings. And so I like that. Oh, yeah. I like it. I like seeing my visual callbacks. Baby Bioship dropping McGann off and both Baby and Bioship both being in attendance made my heart very happy. They can't talk and they're just spaceships, but you know what? I love them and they love McGann <laughs> and they are here for it. Um, also, McGann's got like a vintage inspired wedding dress, which makes perfect sense because she love, oh, loves wow. her 60s TV. Don't 
don't think I haven't been thinking about what McGann's wedding dress would look like since season three happened. Of course I was going to ask have. you how you felt about it. Of yeah. course I have. I like this choice. Um, I guarantee. <laughs> I guarantee that Greg knows what the wedding dress is a reference to. I would be baffled if it wasn't someone's wedding dress or identical yeah. to it. Interesting. Yeah. Hello, Megan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I I like how we we've like canonically Hello Megan in the series has like 16 episodes or something like that. It's like one season. Right. But every time we talk about Hello Megan, we're always like, you know, the blank episode and we make up something that we're like this definitely didn't happen. There was not enough time. I just think back to like our AP where one of us is like, "Oh yes, the graduation episode of Hello Megan." <laughs> right, exactly. What? what? <laughs> um but yes, it is a very nice touch. She's also got the little flower in her hair, which my brain immediately went back to. There's a thing in the comics where when they're at Marie Logan's animal shelter in the Invasion miniseries where he picks flowers and gives them to her and they turn out to be poisonous and he just has to throw them away. But I don't think it's the same flower. That is just where my brain immediately went. Or like, is that a reference to that? Because (laughs) this is how my brain is hardwired. Um, but I think those are red in the comics and hers was just white, but whatever. It was cute. I like everything about also her floating up onto the platform because she's in a full length dress. Very cute. Love it. Icicle Jr. catching the bouquet is hilarious. <laughs> While apparently handcuffed, still caught a bouquet. And <laughs> their first dance being while they are both flying is a beautiful little callback to the first arc of this season. And I was absolutely losing it over absolutely everything at this wedding. Thank you. Thank you both for this. Thank you for coming may to my I, TED Talk. <laughs> may I add uh, Amistad and Leon? Yeah. It's so good. I love that. This the little like, like she just, she gets him. Yeah. I also, on a rewatch, I thought it was funny that when I first watched this episode, my brain just assumed Will was the one sitting next to Leon. And then I realized, no, Will is in Connor's wedding party. Yes. Uh it's it's uh the one of the other <laughs> Roy clones. It's Guardian. It's Guardian, yeah. It's it's uh yeah, yeah, it's Jim. Which I just thought was funny that my brain was like, Yeah, of course that's Willie sitting next to Leon. And then I later was like, Nope, Will Will is standing up there <laughs> next to Connor. That's that's Guardian. I mean, s- sorry, Will, but j- that person was in much better shape. <laughs> sitting next to uh, him. But yeah. Also, to point out for anyone who did not pause this episode as much as we did, uh, Connor's wedding party and McGann's wedding party are both all of the OG team. And on Connor's side, we've also got Superman and Beast Boy. And McGann's side also has Bumblebee. So yeah, it's nice. That's all of my screaming wedding thoughts. I had to get them all out there. I know sometimes I am aggressively me, but my gosh, every detail of this wedding made me so happy. Uh, So good. So good. All right, can I talk about planets now? Yes, talk about planets. <laughs> <laughs> I will sit down. You're the most Thank important part of this stuff. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. There's like I don't even I'm not even sure. I the whole thing's at the end because they they've mentioned Durla many times, which is Comedian Boy's home world. They mentioned Daxum a few times too, in reference to Daxamites coming and attacking Durla and other things. So Daxum is a planet in the comics. Originally, it was a Kryptonian-like planet where the, and sometimes it's like a, an outpost or a settlement of Krypton or something like that. And uh, in the comics, the character Monel comes from Daxum and he, when he's on Earth or under a yellow sun, he has Superboy's powers, but he doesn't have an issue with kryptonite. He has an issue with lead. I don't know why, because why not? So when... She goes to Emerald Empress, <laughs> goes to Daxum. She's got, you know, the, the young Lord Zod in her, we're, we're assuming. I'm like, is this, is Daxum still, is Daxum have a population already? Like, is she, is she landing on this planet and going to interbreed like for a thousand years, her kids like have, you know, marry the locals and they all develop powers? Like, or is it just a empty world and in a thousand years it's going to be populated by Daxamites? I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but the fact that the fact that they tied in 
the Kryptonian history to the Daxamites and how that may affect the future is fascinating to me. But something I've never, ever seen before <laughs> for myself, somebody else can correct me if there's something in the comics, is the idea that Martians populated Daxam. I mean, not Daxam, Durla. So the Durlins, Chameleon Boys people are descendants of Martians, which it makes sense. And it, it folds into how Young Justice makes things roll into each other. Like Beast Boy's origin is not like Beast, Boy, Beast Boy's origin in the comics at all. It, it's a completely new thing with this Miss Martian tie-in, which was beautiful. And I love every every piece of it. It, it raises some questions, though, like why in a thousand years did because the because the Durlins don't have. They can't fly. They don't have superpowers. They don't have levitation. They're shape changers. They're fully shape changers. So I'm sure they've thought this out already, but that was fascinating to me. And then Trombus was an interesting one because I had to look this one up. <laughs> With Trombus, there was a yet another Kryptonian-like planet that was under a yellow sun where the people of that planet did not have powers under the yellow sun, did not have powers under the yellow sun. That planet blew up and a family was sent to a planet with a red sun, Trombus. And under the red sun, they have powers. So there's a family of super people that have powers under the red sun called the Hyper Family. And they defense Trombus and do good deeds on this planet. <laughs> They've used Trombus to send to, with the idea that we're going to send Kryptonians to this place. And then I don't even know what to do with that. Like, were they just like, hey, we need a planet. Let's use this planet with this funny, super people like story on it. Or are they going to do something with that nonsense? Like they end up changing so they develop their powers under it. I don't know. Anyway, it was very strange. And to be clear, this was absolutely not the most important things that are going on in this episode. But I mean, you can be hyped about lore, and I can be hyped about superhero <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. The lore between the Martians becoming the Durlins and the Kryptonians becoming the Daxamites, and it, it plugs some holes in some things and makes some things interesting. I just have a lot of questions about what happened with the Martians losing powers to become Chameleon Boy's people. And I mean, when you're a shape-shifting race, like Chameleon Boy theoretically has a form he he turns back into when he's unconscious. Is that his base form? Like, do they all just decide to have a different form? Do they want to be different in some way? There's got to be some lore or something happens over the next thousand years, which is interesting to me. And then how does that work with like your history? Why would, why would they not know that? Like it's been a thousand years. Like we came from another planet. We don't know where at least, which might be part of their history. We just don't know anything. They never gave us an in-depth history lesson from any of the Legionnaires that much because, you know, they had a mission. They they needed to do something. And what that tells me is that maybe I'm going to get some more Legion in the future, (laughs) including a Legion spinoff. A Young Justice Legion version spinoff would be fantastic. I would love all of that. That would be fantastic. So I think that's, I think that's everything that I've, I think it's everything I've got for this one. Yeah. I, Neil, wait, you, you good? Got Neil, you got anything to add? I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> one, also just putting Macomb there could also just ruin the planet and have nothing to do with a transition into an alternate race. It just could ruin everything. Um, that was my that was my other thought was, um, are you being a jerk, Darkseid? Because that's my first assumption. You're not, you're not nice. No, the I don't think I have too much more. I'm trying to think of... I mean, do we want, do we have modes that we want to crash, or have we crashed them in the aster? Um, that was my other thought. I had a little thing for crash in the mode, but crash modes. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In Crash in the Mode, we will be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording, which means that this crashing the mode is based on. The entirety of season four and not the trailer anymore because we've seen it all. (laughs) So (laughs) the one thing that I threw into Crash in the Mode because I don't know what to do with it is Black Canary talks about that they need to set up some sort of, you know, a mental health facility situation for superheroes because gosh dang it, this was a pretty traumatic season and everybody needs some support. Um, And I'm like, that's. Great. That seems totally 
that seems like a totally great thing to do. And then the internet started screaming about a particular word that she says, where she calls it a sanctuary. And apparently, that's what the place is called in uh, Heroes in Crisis, which I did not read, but is a thing largely about superheroes and mental health that then gets into some iffy stuff that a lot of people didn't really like that I think got retconned later. Uh, But, you know, if we were doing some of that stuff of what if we make a place where heroes can, you know, chill for 10 minutes and talk to a therapist who isn't just Black Canary because she's carrying the weight of way too many people, (laughs) that would be cool. If we take out the iffy stuff, if we take out, you know, the the weird problem stuff uh, and just, you know. Well, and we have a history of doing that. Yeah. Because, I mean, like you know. a lot of as as famous and popular as Judas Contract is, there's some pretty rereading it did not age well on certain sections with Tara and Deathstroke and all that. And it was handled so Killing well. Killing Joke. As, so, as famous as Killing Joke is. Killing Joke. <sighs> right. Um, so, yeah, that's why I'm not. Even after hearing people be like, that's a thing from Heroes in Crisis, I'm not really worried. I'm like, I trust this show to generally approach things with a level of how do we keep the interesting part of this without the not fun parts of it. Right. So, yeah, just needed to call that out because that was the one conversation at the wedding that we didn't talk about yet. (laughs) Also, yeah, the, the, the conversations at the wedding, all of them made me laugh. Of just like, oh, no, 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 no. oh yeah, Metron, New Gods, no, no, no. And just every conversation made me laugh. So I think crashing the mode and ends that are loose, um, because that's another thing that I've seen online. And, you know, the showrunners have definitely alluded to the fact these seasons don't end on cliffhangers. They end on the fact that the world exists and will keep existing with or without our ability to look in on it. That's how I see, that's how I personally see young yeah. justice is that it is a truly living world and the seasons or the comics are just our view into that world with or without us it will continue on that's yes that's how i see it now there are certain things that like i don't know why we, uh, we were introduced to them and then they are gone um like what's happening on assassin islands um yeah i don't i don't know but if there is a season five thing that does some sanctuary stuff, the fact that Cheshire is on a mental health retreat uh-huh. on an assassin island, who knows? Don't these things sound like they could be connected in a storyline if there was a season five? I also think of um, the things with Markovia and having to reconcile being used and abused by Barzovi, um, messing up your mind every time he gets a chance. And similarly connected to that, like we talked a little bit about the conversation Queen Perdita has with Garfield and it's good conversation. It's important. I know some people were like, how has she moved on already? Who is she dating? And I'm like, I don't think that's what she meant at all. I guess moved on can just be moved on. But I also feel like that whole conversation, the same way that the whole thing with Brion and Markovia uh, that we saw a little bit earlier in the season is setting up a little bit for the current ongoing tie-in comics miniseries, Young Justice Targets, which at the time of recording, I have not yet uh, read. I know the first issue is out. I haven't gotten a chance to read it yet, but we know that Queen Perdita plays a major role in those comics. So I don't think it is an accident that in the finale, we get a short but emotional conversation between her and Gar so that we can set the stage for those stakes to go into the tie-in comics. Yeah, I haven't read those. I haven't read that one either. I need to pick it up. I've read it. Hey, everyone, if you go online anywhere, you can find more about the release schedule for that because it's a little bit complicated. But basically, there's they're releasing on DC Universe uh, Infinite with the full comic. And then like a then there's also stuff with comiXology and how those are getting released with like director's cuts. And then, you know, if you just wait a month after the DC Universe Infinite release, you can pick it up at your local comic book store in physical form with the full story set in both present and past because they're doing two stories in every issue is the rundown, I believe, of all the details on that, yep. which we're throwing in crashing the mode. But really, it's because it's crashing the mode. If we're talking about the season, we're not talking about the tie in comics yet, which happened after the not season. Yet. 
which happened after the season, so are technically crashing the mode. Any other any other tinfoil hat theories to throw in our crash in the mode? No, I don't think so. I think mine was like a mine was the the planets were like a coin toss. I don't think they're gonna do anything with it Who knows? in the next thousand Rich. years. But maybe. I don't know. So I mean you have the ever the ever present and looming vandal versus dark side because eventually that has to come to a head it's very cordial at this time of hello good sir i see that you'd like this kryptonian i'd like to take all of these does that work for you it seems that it does okay thank you ultimately (laughs) we're going to try and kill each other to see who gets to take over earth but for now um yeah we, we, we have a mutual agreement to be somewhat nice so. I'm sure it'll be fine. That was a really good Vandal Savage imitation. By the way. <laughs> yes. Also, speaking of <laughs> next season, what is your guess for a time jump? Because obviously there is one. I have no idea. Uh, so the funniest thing, and I, I will start with the funniest thing that I've seen, um, and it was on Reddit. <laughs> so please don't go there. Just listen to me and never go <laughs> onto Reddit. That's that's okay. my stuff. <laughs> Because the comment, the comments, yeah, it, it went sideways. The person was like, it should absolutely be eight years in the future so that we can have Damien and Jonathan doing things. And everyone was like, that's garbage. Please don't say this. I just, I just why. I absolutely want to see Damien and, and Jonathan doing things together. Yeah. But I don't think it's season five. Super I Sons season would be six. very fun. But yeah, it's a little further down down the line, I would think. We just we need a little time. Damien, still so small. Uh still so small and so unnamed. <laughs> yep. I would say still. technically technically still referred to as the baby. And yeah, also him and the red hooded right. ninja. Thank you. Yes. As of yet, right, exactly. they are just random background individuals. Yes. The, um, the baby we're calling Damien's name is really George. <laughs> so it's just... Batman wasn't Justice involved universe. in that situation at all. <laughs> hey, I'm George. It's someone else. It's some other kid. It's um, Alfred. <laughs> no. <laughs> we have time travel. Uh, <laughs> yes, we do. Fine. We can solve that problem. Okay. I don't even know where that went. What uh, did you say? We went left? Yes, we did. <laughs> I think so. I don't think I have anything else. Neither do I. We'll just see where it goes. All fingers crossed for more stories. Uh, and with all of that, I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that somehow is not enough for you, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a little harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the moat. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay Stay well, everyone. everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. 